So let's get started. You'll notice that I've talked about global warming, climate change, and, and global climate disruption. Those are all terms that we see in the media. But tonight I'm going to capitalize on this story. We'll start at the beginning and work ourselves into the complexity of it. And maybe you'll see why I've chosen climate uh, disruption as a better description of what we're experiencing. So the first thing I want to do is say this is a science-based evidence talk. But I'm not going to be give you complicated equations. But I want you to be clear that this is the known knowns from scientific research. And we use a process called the scientific method to get consensus. And I said it in the video. I've stated it again here. This is what we know. So we'll start with the Earth's climate, the big picture. Basically, we get all of our energy from the sun. It comes in as solar radiation. It strikes the Earth. And the Earth heats up and releases that, that heat that it gains during the daytime back at night as, to space as, as lost heat. But the important part is that our atmosphere is not completely what we call transparent. It, if we radiated all the energy that we got from the sun back to space at night, we can calculate that our Earth would be a balmy zero degrees Fahrenheit. But because we have greenhouse gases, we're able to maintain the current temperature of about 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And, and what's really important to notice that the greenhouse gases that get that caused this thermal blanket, this warming of our planet. It's only 0.05% by mass. And I'm excluding water vapor in this for the time being. 0.05% by mass of all the greenhouse gases is the difference between 0 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The other piece of information is, OK, where's the increase greenhouse gases coming from? And I've got a diagram up here. And like good scientists, we make sure the font is small and you can't see it in the back. But the pictures are showing there's about 10 greenhouse gases that are responsible for keeping our planet warm. And these greenhouse gases are shown here. I'm not going to go through all the labels. But basically, we should see that from a period of about 1970 to 2005, that each one of the individual greenhouse gases that we've called out in different colors here, there's not much change over time in their contribution to the total amount of greenhouse gases. This is the culprit right here. And this is carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuel. So how do we know that? There's about 14 different kinds of uh, uh, carbon isotopes in the atmosphere. We're all familiar with carbon-12. Carbon-14 is something that we use for carbon dating and understanding how old things are. But carbon-13 is very unique. Plants use carbon-13. And when they die and they go to a soupy mess called oil and congeal into coal, if we burn that, we find a distinct signature of carbon-13. So we can measure the ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12. And that gives us the increase of the total carbon in the atmosphere due to the contribution of burning plants. And it turns out that the total that we see this increase this is the biggest increase, and the reason why we're increasing greenhouse gases is uniquely attributable to what we see as these global temperatures, Earth warming. So based on that, there is little doubt that our Earth, on a global scale, is warming and is due to increased human-produced carbon dioxide. Now, you've probably heard in the news that there's 90%, 97% consensus by scientists. And this is the consensus of, 90, of 97%. So this is our consensus. And I'm going to talk a lot tonight about consensus, because that means science-based evidence. This is where we all agree. Some people say, why not 100%? I would say getting 97% of anybody to agree to anything is pretty good. So we do know that the Earth can warm and will warm because of the increase of greenhouse gases. But the things that we don't know, some of the unknowns, is, is understanding the timing and the regional impact of how it will affect us. And that's where our journey begins. In studying the Earth's climate if, at, at much more uh, detailed scales than Earth is a round rubber ball, we certainly like to know what's going to happen where we live. And so as we go from the Earth as a round, simple model to come down to understand what's happened to us in our neighborhood, we want to go back and understand all the complicated processes that take place. And so we say, well, let's look for another example of a model we've studied before. Well, unfortunately, we haven't done climates on other planets. And so we have to stand and start with our own. And that's pretty complicated, because 
we didn't start thinking about how Mother Nature works on our planet. So we really have to start from scratch if we want to understand how global warming will affect us where we live. So in the absence of another planet, how do we do this? It all starts with data. You have to give me measurements. We can, from these measurements, come up with scientific uh, ideas and theories and test them and vet them. And that's really important because the scientific process is about vetting scientists' arguments about the cause of, a, of an issue. We call those theories when they're vetted. And they're sort of at the, uh, the teacher's handbook at the end. It gives you all the right answers. They come from theories. And I would pose to you tonight that of all the careers that you could choose, of all the types of things that are out there, that probably scientists do more to vet their theories and responses than any other profession. We're scientists. So science, in my mind, is still a very noble profession. And this is what this is about. So how do we get all this data, and how do we vet it, and how do we come up with ideas? It's an enormous task. What we've learned over time is that um, spatial and temporal scales of the things that we need to know about climate, from the Earth is a round rubber ball to what's happening in my neighborhood, span at least 12 orders of magnitude in temporal and spatial range. That's a lot. And so to understand all these processes, I can't do it in the back of an envelope, so we actually need lots of information, lots of theories, lots of things that we can test with hypotheses in computer models and simulations. And if we need to put this all together, we really need some large supercomputers. After all, if we come up with an idea of how we think our climate works now, the ideas that we get now have to be consistent with sparse, but the few data that we have from millions of years ago. And we certainly want to project it correctly into the future, forecast. So to get it right, we have a lot of technology now. We can get the data, but it's a lot of it to process. So where do we get the data? Um, I'm currently, for the last really two decades of my research life at, at Argonne, I've been involved with the, the Atmospheric Radiation Measurement Program, or the ARM program. And it's a climate research facility. It's actually a national user facility for climate research. Now, you might think of of user facilities as beam lines, like at Argonne or at Fermilab. But our facility is not on the campus of Argonne. We actually have to go to where the scientists need the observations. So we have clusters of, of the largest clusters of, of surface-based ground remote, remote sensors in the world to understand what scientists need to know to get the data for atmospheric processes. How does the sun interact with the surface of the Earth? Where does that energy go, and can we account for all of it? Because if we understand where the heat is being lost and how it's being used, we should have a good idea of how to model that and forecast. If we keep increasing climate change and it makes the Earth warmer, where is that heat going to go? Can we account for it? So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to be with this program. And my job is now with senior management. You know, When you're a good scientist, they eventually make you a manager of a program in some way. And so the idea is that, that I've been involved with this program since day one. And we set up some permanent research sites in the Arctic. We did it in the tropical Western Pacific. And we did it in a mid-latitude site in the United States. These are permanent sites. They've been there for more than two, two decades, collecting data, observations, 24-7, remote sensing. We got data points. And they're quality assured. And we can turn them around to users for free. We make the data available to anybody that can sign up and, and tell us where you want the data sent. And I think that's a really good philosophy that the program had, because if you really want to understand a problem that's affecting lots of people, put the data out there free. Don't hoard it and try to write a publication first. Put it out there and give the entire world an opportunity to get this quality assured data and, and let the truth be discovered. And so these other points on this is how do we get all of our scientific equipment to places where the scientists want to take us? And that's the user facility component of it. We have about 10 tractor trailer trucks worth of really neat toys. And we can move them to these spots around the world. And the places that we go are, guess what, where the models and the observations don't agree. So we can plant our mobile sites there for one or two years. And with very specific scientific yes, no type of hypotheses, we can learn more and more about the known knowns of the things that we need to put in the equations to do the modeling. And so another point of this is tonight that usually when you go to series like this, you get to hear a particular um, 
uh, expertise that I'm doing a particular research thing, maybe I'm on a track for a Nobel Prize, and you get to hear what I'm doing. But tonight, it's different. In this case, our facility has been able to have over 5,000 climate scientists come through our doors and use our information. And part of my job is to interact with them and understand the measurements that we provide them, does it provide the information they need for the science questions they're trying to address. And the only thing we ask from them is, you know, when you're done with your experiment, how about writing us a light, uh, sort of a, a one-page blurb on what you found? So tonight's story is not about my research. It's about the research of 5,000 colleagues and I'm editing their story tonight. So it is a story about climate change. So climate models, it's very important. It's, we need to put what we know into the computers, and we need to put in there, as we go from a global scale to a regional to a local scale, the complexity increases. And so as we have ideas of how all these processes are connected and how Mother Nature works, we can understand by providing the model we can go back and validate the model's results with the data that we're collecting. What a unique way to do business. So we want to see how well we, we, what we observe is represented by what we think we know in our theories and in our model predictions. And as you might imagine, going from the world as a round rubber ball to, to where we live, all that sunlight interacts with the surface to generate that heat. And our surface is very complicated. It has lots of things on the surface, not only the color of the grass or the trees that you choose, or if you've got a swimming pool or a pond in your backyard, or the color of the roof tiles, or whether you use concrete or asphalt, it all makes a difference of how that energy gets distributed where you live. And we have to understand all those things to be able to get a model down to a forecast of where you live. And up until now, I was talking about some of the issues with atmospheric measurements. After all, the first path of the sunlight is through the atmosphere. But you know what? When it comes down to the Earth, it, it interacts with oceans and glacial ice systems and terrestrial ecology and biological systems. This is just the representation for atmospheric. Oh my goodness, it's getting pretty complicated. And so the picture we're trying to solve is, is substantially difficult, but we're working on trying with the observations that we collect be able to better understand through the models that we forecast and validate with the observations what we know about Mother Nature. After all, if we get that right, we can begin to understand what will happen in 10, 100, 1,000 years to the things we're doing now. So again, we don't live in average. We live down right in a particular neighborhood, and we certainly want to know what happens where we live. So up until now, I've been talking about global warming. But as you can see, on a global scale, increased greenhouse gases, sure, it'll lead to a warmer planet on average, but it really doesn't tell the whole picture because it's complicated. As a matter of fact, temperature is not in itself the, probably the biggest thing that we're going to have to worry about, about global warming. We expect to see changes in precipitation patterns and sea level rise that will have much greater impact to humans and our animal friends and biodiversity than just temperature alone. And matter of fact, we're pretty sure that we're going to see increased weather extremes. And perhaps you're noticing some of them as well. So therefore, the social science of it aspect of it is global warming. It's pretty hard to explain global warming around the world when it's 10 below in Chicago. But we can talk about climate change. So what do I mean by that? If we kind of change from global warming to climate change, Basically, the Earth doesn't stand still, and all those greenhouse gases in the atmosphere just don't heat up the air. It's not a static system. The air is communicating with the surface. And so that energy that's been transported to the atmosphere will be quickly distributed by other things that air is coming in contact with. It's going to come in contact with glaciers and ice, and it's going to come in, in contact with oceans, and it's going to come in and result in evaporating water and sunlight interactions with clouds and aerosols. And suddenly, it's a very dynamic relationship. All this is happening at once. So if you want to get your finger on the pulse of what's the temperature of the Earth, and you put a thermometer in everybody's mouth, every square foot around the world, it's changing. And so how will those changes affect? We think it's going to be more weather issues, not just simply the warming of the atmosphere. So a better representation of global warming might be understanding climate and weather. So back in the day, the World Meteorological Organization, when countries started doing weather measurements, decided, you know, we're making all these weather measurements where we live. 
And it would be a good idea if we sort of fundamentally share with other countries how we're going to keep weather statistics so we can share them. And it was decided that we would take a 30-year average of a particular location. I don't know why 30 years. It just came up that way. That we're going to take 30-year average and call that representative of a temperature or a wind speed or a precipitation pattern where we live. And we'll take all those weather variables, and that will define the climate where we live. So that sort of makes sense. And to put it in perspective, when you watch the evening news, you'll see the forecaster talking about the high and low for today. And you'll see the temperature was today above average. And you'll see the normal. And that normal really comes from the 30-year average. It's, a, it's a, just an accumulation of all the 30-year averages in Chicago. And so we can go back and say, on average, we can say, on this particular date, what should the temperature be? And we'll either be on average, or we'll be above or below. And that daily variability is the variance in weather compared to our climate, which is sort of the average where we live. So the, the, the standard sort of pat answer for this is weather is what you get where you live, and, and, and weather is what you might expect. Or I'm sorry, climate is what you might expect. So it's interesting that the variance in weather is predictable as long as the climate is not changing drastically. Hmm. So I would give you an idea here that says that probably climate constrains the weather. The weather varies all the time, but it's within the boundaries of the energy balance that it gets from the sun. So um, I had a very difficult time with statistics in, in graduate school. I know there's some in the room that, that, that live in this world. I would probably tell you, for those that appreciate my sense of, of mathematics, um, that statistics are a form of torture for numbers. <laughs> and numbers are very wimpy. And if you torture them long enough, they'll tell you anything. <laughs> and so, but one of the things about statistics is very important about using climate models and even the argument tonight about weather extremes is a normal distribution. So this is sort of statistics 101. And what I wanted to do to describe this is that if we were to plot all the daily total rainfalls that we had for the last 100 years and how many times that total was achieved as a frequency plot, we would get a normal distribution, which means that there's a, a common rain, rainfall pattern that we might expect. But there will be extreme events of very small amounts and extreme events where there are very large amounts. And if we were to do this over 100 years, we can say the 100-year flood is defined as the 1% or less exceedance probability of the occurrence of a single weather event, a rainfall. So for example, the 100-year probability of rainfall for Chicago might be six inches of rain at one daily time, six inches of one day. And so some of us probably have lived in areas where we've got flooded basements. And we're probably noticing that the 100-year event is sort of happening more frequently. And this is what we might expect if suddenly the brakes are off the constraints of climate that kind of constrains the weather. So what happens if the climate is changing? The current thinking is, is that the frequency of weather extremes will increase. And I don't think you have to be a climate researcher to figure out that we've been experiencing this. So if I look back to the, to, to the National Weather Service, they collect on websites and tell you what are the extreme events that happened in 2014. Now, I've shown their slide here, and I, I don't expect you to read them all, but we certainly had some weather extremes this year. And it's not just precipitation. It could be cold. It could be cloudy. We certainly had a lot of cloudiness this year. And so we hear some of these statistics. It was the coldest December on record or the coldest February on record. And so we would expect that we, we'd be able to predict these frequency of of, of extreme events with a normal distribution, which is, says, hey, we should only get one of these every 100 years. How come we're getting one of all different kinds just in the United States, and they're happening every year, sometimes a month apart, sometimes weeks apart? So th there's growing scientific consensus that what we really believe is that we no longer know the distribution of extreme weather events. So. In that example, you know, where's your global warming? I'm, I'm sure we all bundled up and had some of those cold days that we remember. But while we were doing our damnedest here to keep the average global temperature of warming down in Chicago, there were other places in the world were doing their darndest to increase. So while we were cold this winter in Chicago, Australia was setting another record. The Eastern Pacific Ocean was setting a record for warmth. Siberia, it's pretty interesting, you probably heard about 
uh, some of the tundra was actually melting and they were getting these big craters that were opening up because methane gas was being released from the frozen Siberia. In California, not only they have um, uh, extreme warm events, but they've been also with droughts and also in Northern Europe. So again, just because it's a global event and it's cold where we are doesn't mean that it isn't warmer, much warmer, because in 2014, it was the warmest year since we've been keeping records for our entire planet. So I'm a visual guy. Uh, I just want to keep it in perspective. The climate change is really a matter of perspective. I think you get the idea. So here's some matters of perspective. Um, some of the snowmageddon events, you know, we thought we had it bad last year. We got almost like 90, 92 inches of snow over our season. Think about it. Boston area got 92 inches in about three weeks. Hokey smoke. So we, we see these extreme events. And I've shown you some of the air, ice storms that put out power outages and school closings um, and snow plows even stuck in the snow. And also some of the things that go with it. I mean, you know, we're stuck home. We can't get out. And, and so we have cabin fever, and we have other things that sort of result from being stuck at home. And clearly, you know, there are, are some ideas with flooding, and, and if you get flooded and you get the 100-year event pretty frequently, there's some alternative engineering solutions to maintain your farmstead. And also, there are some places in the world that while we're complaining about being too cold, it's certainly too warm and it's too dry. Or intense hurricanes. We've been hearing um, just in the last year and a half, we've had three of the strongest typhoons ever recorded, hurricanes in the Pacific. And, and yet we've had three of these events. It'll never happen again. We've had three in the last year and a half. And intense tornadoes, if you've been following, as a former storm chaser, um, basically looking at the number of tornadoes hasn't increased, but the number of F4 and F5, the severe tornadoes, that statistics has in increased dramatically. And so, we can see some of these extreme events from a, from a research point of view, but they're probably pretty noticeable to the public as well. And again, we're getting more heat waves. And also, you know, if we have droughts, we have more wildfires. Boy, California had wildfires all year long. They got it well outside of their normal fire region or fire time period. So where are we then? So one of the ideas, I haven't focused on the Midwest. Well, let's pick on the Midwest. You know, we don't have consensus on that the models are all accurate yet, but they're getting smarter. And so what if we took a, a dozen of those models and we said, hey, let's look at where we at least regionally live, and let's, let's look about some ideas that science are speculating on what might happen here. We don't have consensus, but based on the scientific evidence that we're getting, we certainly have some pretty good ideas of what, what might happen. So let's ask a couple of models, take their average, what might happen to where we live in the next 100 years? So certainly right now, it says, it suggests that the model suggests it will be considerably warmer, but there'll be less precipitation in the summertime. We'll get more heat waves. And in this, they talk about, you'll see in the text, uh, lower and higher emission scenarios. That means if we were to continue with no breaks on, on the pollution that we're giving to greenhouse gases, that would be the current upper, uh, upper scenario of emissions. The upper end is what we expect. The lower end is what if we stopped emissions at, let's say, the 2010 level and just kept them there? What would happen? The problem is we can't go back in time. It's unfortunate, but even if we were to eliminate all the carbon dioxide burning in the atmosphere, the atmosphere cannot get rid of it. So let's look at some other examples. They, they think we'll get more heat waves and, and more if we don't do anything right now. And also, that interesting enough, they predict that the water in Lake Michigan will drop nearly two feet. Well, that's an interesting one. So what else do we learn? Well, you know, it's funny. The average precipitation for the year will probably pretty much look the same as we have now. But the way we get it administered won't be sort of rain once a week. It will be like we'll get a, we'll get a period of drought in the summertime, and then we'll get our, our rainfall in a couple of big events, either in early spring or late fall. So the distribution, the way we receive precipitation, will be different. So there'll be periods of floods and deficits. Just the average will be the same. And so what does that mean? We might have a longer growing season. But the problem is that even though we have a longer growing season, hey, you know what? It used to be pretty cold in Chicago, and we could keep those little pesty bugs out that might ruin some of those crops. We never had to deal with that before. 
And so if we have warmer environment for plants, we also have a warmer environment for other things that like a warmer environment. And maybe they wouldn't be so welcome. And so if any of you are avid growers of plants, you always look at back at the package, and you can see in the back, it tells you where you can, the hardiness zone where you can plant your seeds and they will survive. Well, put it in perspective that, that the plant winter hardiness zones in the Midwest are projected to shift by one half to one full zone every 30 years. Wow, you know, they come around and say, I'd like to put native species in my yard. What will those native species, what are they? Are they what they were 30 years ago or 90 years ago? Or should I be thinking about what I should be planning for the future? And so, by the end of the century, plants now associated with the southeast are likely to become established through the Midwest. Native species that grew here fine may not do very well because of increasing threats that our climate protected them from. And I'm particularly sensitive to this. I moved into a new house in 1986, and my wife and I were very proud that we went through and we tried to put everything that was native to Illinois. And I planted green ash trees in the parkway because, boy, they could tolerate drought and they could tolerate floods and they could tolerate clay, and they were perfect for shade. And I just had two of those trees removed from the parkway this year because of the emerald, or, uh, emerald uh, ash borer. So you know what? This is hitting me close to home, that's for sure. So where are we from the predictions? Well, based on what I was telling you about what do those uh, models predict, you know, maybe we should see what it's like in Houston, Texas because the climate where my dad lives might be more like what Illinois might be like in 100 years. Now, again, this is not what we have consensus for, but it's a pretty good educated guess. And if we're going to prepare for what the things might be in the future, we should get some good ideas now. So you've probably seen that I've, I've gone from weather to other things. I'm starting to talk about bugs and show pictures of animals and so forth. So the term climate change can be misleading. The impact of global climate change has deep roots. It not only hits us with plants and humans, but in economy, health, politics. That's all in the news. And so it's not just about the weather. How might climate change affect human health? And our, how about our animal friends? I started looking for some ideas to give you some ideas about what others think about what the future might be like with climate. And I looked at uh, this one particular article that talked about human health risks and environmental factors. And it really struck me that the highest risk are, are in the yellow and red colors, and the lowest risk are in the green colors. And so we, we talk about environmental factors. You know, you go to the doctor. You know, it's not hereditary. It's environmental factors. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're going to touch on that a little bit. But the basic line, is, is, uh, line in this slide is that, guess what? The areas that pollute the most are the least sensitive to the health risks and environmental factors. The, the populations that tend to be most affected are south of the equator, and that pretty well lines up with people that aren't polluting but live off the land. And a small change in precipitation patterns in Africa for people that are growing their own crops is a big problem for that entire civilization. And so we can get a little bit more technical. We can talk about human health and vector-borne diseases. I love the word zoonoic and vector-borne diseases. What does that mean? That means that the wind patterns change and bugs and insects that piggyback in the wind or on other animals that will migrate because the climate is getting more receptive to wherever they're going to go, that's going to change. And they're going to be able to adapt to probably different environments. And that will bring all the problems along with the pests and the insects of diseases that they carry. And biodiversity, this is a big one. It turns out that the Illinois Panel on Climate Change, uh, Illinois, the International Panel on Climate Change estimates that 20 to 30 percent of our plant and animal species evaluated so far in climate change studies are at risk of extinction. Projected rates of species extinction are 10 times greater now than we've observed in the distant well, in the, in the recent past, but at 10,000 times greater than the rates of deserved in fossil fuel records. That's pretty scary. And some of the examples I wanted to show you, I mean, you know, these animals have faces. You know, it's our, whoops, sorry. It's our, 
Oops, too far again. So we have some of the examples of, of the people we've talked about. I didn't know what a, what a pika was, and I looked it up. <coughs> Cute little guys. And so fish, polar bears, seals. And it seems to be the species that are particularly climate sensitive are those that are in the mountain elevations and, and sort of in, in what I would call the, the uh, sea ice habitat, the Arctic. Biodiversity. There was a nice article that talked about threats to human water and, and uh, security and, and river biodiversity. But I showed this one because I wanted to give a balanced approach. Then in this particular case, it shows that we may actually have river biodiversity loss in the northern section of the equator and not so much in the south. And part of this is, is not only due to climatic change, but it's also to the fact that we really rely on pesticides and, and management. And we have a lot of runoff from our soils into rivers. And so it's not just climate alone, but in managing the plants or a new climate, we might be having to give more insecticides to prevent pests that we didn't think we were going to have. And so that gets washed into the rivers in the freshwater basins. So in this particular case, yep, we got to worry about river biodiversity, even in the northern hemisphere. So biodiversity, oceans. Boy, the Earth is covered mostly by oceans, so that's a big effect if something happens there. And so we have these beautiful coral reefs. And we already know that as the oceans gets warmer, that the, ash, that the oceans actually become more acidic. And acid becoming more acidic is a bad thing for coral reefs and all of the habitat that's supported by that. It's interesting to note that where is all our global warming going? Most of that heat energy is going into the oceans. Now, it seems like, well, aren't the oceans getting warmer? Sure they are. But I'm sure you all have, some of you have a swimming pool in the backyard. And if you're just using natural sunlight to heat up that water in that pool in the summertime, it takes a long time to heat up that swimming pool because the heat capacity of water is very large. So it takes a lot of sunlight and warmth to just change the temperature of your swimming pool a little bit. Same thing with the oceans. We thought initially we should be looking for climate change at the temperature of the atmosphere. But guess what? It's being drawn out of the atmosphere by the oceans. It's heating up the oceans. But it's a lot harder to detect. A small change in ocean average temperature is a huge effect on a heat sink for global warming. And so there's economics. You know, there's a cost for solutions, and there's the cost of impact. And I, I heard two reports just recently in the radio. One I looked up. I had an interesting question the other night that asked me, how many research dollars are being spent by federal agencies for climate research. I looked it up. In the US GCRP climate change research program, there are 13 federal agencies that are, fed, uh, that are funded by that. And it's about $2.5 billion across all federal agencies to study climate research. A little factoid. We've, we've had some uh, extreme temperature events and, and winter snowfall events in, in January and February pretty much dominated by what happened in New England. But I just heard on the radio the other day that, that the, someone did a, a study of the loss of, of wages and sales for just the six-week period where we had this extreme snow events in New England and in, in the upper Midwest. And that cost was $2 billion. That's just two events. So when people say you're spending a lot of money on climate research, I agree. But we should look at the impact of the problem. And I haven't included insurance companies here and in effects of tornadoes and so forth. Just the winter. So it's a big problem. And we can't duck that it's going to cost. So taken as a whole, you know, um, positive mental attitude is a really wonderful way to deal with change. You know, when I used to deal with change, we always make a list. What's good, what's bad about change? And why do we always start with what's bad? So we've learned that you know, we want to be optimists and positive uh, mental attitude. And a way to deal with that is not all change is bad. Well, talking about climate change, it's, it's, it's not good. And so maybe it's wrong to portray climate change as, with positive mental attitude. Maybe we should start to talk about it as climate disruption. Because of the things I'm talking about, it seems to be extremely disruptive. And so maybe the better way to characterize what's happening in these extreme weather events is to think about it as climate disruption. Maybe it more accurately represents what we're, the journey we are about to be 
I'm barking upon. So I don't want to leave you with just like all the problems of the world. It's not all, it's not all gloom and doom. And there's alternative energy sources and energy conversation, uh, uh, conservation is certainly a good way to start. So we've started to diverse. And this is really important um, that we look at alternative fuels. You know, we didn't on purpose to go out and think that gasoline and, and fuel and oil was going to be a bad thing to the environment. And so we can look at different ways. And we see a lot of even, even the commercial industries are trying to help us conserve electricity. So look at alternative fuel sources and help us to conserve what we now use. And so where do we put our investments? Well, we have about four options. We can do more research. We can do something called mitigation. We can try to offset global warming by some other thing. We can adapt. And so maybe engineering might be, well, if the planet is getting warmer, maybe somehow we, 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 we divert some of the sun's radiant energy so we get less incoming solar heat. Adapting, well, you know, maybe we should just engineer solutions, you know, just build bigger seawalls. Or, you know, there's always an option, do nothing and, and, and endure the impacts. And, you know, um, that's kind of like that. So, and there's politics. I don't want to get into politics tonight, but certainly climate has been political and it's not been a good a time. You know, we thought, oh, wow, you know, climate is a big deal and it'll, it'll, it'll be in political battles and we'll be part of the party candidate, you know, and we'll get more funding. Well, um, climate change, global disruption, has its enemies as well. And so the hard part about science is that we remain loyal to the process of learning truth. It's up to somebody else to say, take what we know and look at the world as a bigger hole than the economics and tell us how we're going to fix this. And so we like fair policies. But as you saw before, there's this little cartoon. You know, those north of the equator that, that seem to be in a better position for climate change um, are, are doing their best to reduce emissions, and it's been costly to do that. And yet, it's the South that seems to get the impact. How are we going to come up with a fair policy that all can buy into and share equally? And certainly, there's different ways to, to, to concern yourselves about uh, getting the message out. We used to, to lobby uh, Congress, then we used to lobby lobbyists, lobbyists and, and scientists now say the best thing that we can do is lobby the public, lobby you. If we can be clear about the science we're doing and communicate science-based evidence to you, you are our best advocates. So global geoengineering, what is that? Well, there's some clever ideas that have been postulated about maybe we can put you know, airplanes and put all the commercial airliners that let aerosol that somehow block the incoming sunlight. Or maybe we can do some other clever, uh, clever things by doing some uh, ocean fertilization that triggers algae blooms and and somehow change the color of the ocean and do some things. Maybe we can capture and, uh, the, the carbon and burn it. But that's on a global scale. And, and I would pose the question, do we really know enough about how Mother Nature works to be able to design an experiment where Earth, the entire Earth, is our laboratory? Some of the things that have been suggested, we know that, that, that uh, huge volcanic eruptions have cooled the Earth in the past. Oh, I know, let's trigger some volcanic eruptions. Uh, maybe that's a good idea. Well, um, again, you know, do we know enough about the physics of Mother Nature to say that would be a controlled experiment? How about adaptation? Um, you know, it's really neat that we can adapt to these small water rising. But if you were to melt all the, the water on the planet, actually the oceans would rise 220 feet. So the next time you're driving down Lakeshore Drive, I want you to look up to the 22nd floor of, of one of the taller buildings. That would be the, the, the depth of the ocean. And so that's not going to happen overnight. I don't want you to go out and think that you have to buy you know, high ground real estate. But it is happening. And so you know, it, it, it gets to some of these cartoons that you know, um, I know. Let's get all the sand from the dry regions and build larger walls to keep out the floods of the flooded regions. I know it's a bad comic. But it kind of makes you think, how are we going to do this? And if you think about it, most of the large cities and trade cities and so forth are seaports. And how are we going to move that infrastructure away from the vulnerable sea surface areas? And, and, and that's, that's a real challenge. More research. Well, OK, I'll admit it. I'm a proponent for this. But some of the real questions that we have about this, do we have time to figure this out before we can take some educated action? There is large uncertainty. We know that climate 
disruption is real. But there's still uncertainty about the timing and the magnitude. And the major impacts that might be realized, maybe they won't be 100 years out. Maybe it'll be sooner than that. So what do we do? Well, we want to make good investments. My grandfather used to say, money's like manure. You got to spread it around to do any good. And so as a good investor, we do want a diverse portfolio. But where does that come from? You know that $2.5 billion that we get for research? That comes from taxpayers. OK? So where does that money come from? It comes from your wallet. And so in some ways, you can pay me now or pay me later. We have to figure out best ways to take the science that we're learning and, 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 and put in effective economic policies. I understand that. But that's in a challenge in itself. So your future, it's not all gloom and doom. I think that the best thing we could do is educate you, the public, about what's going on in science. Understanding through research and accurately modeling how Mother Nature works will help us to improve climate forecasting. We'll know more about the known knowns and less about the unknown knowns. And advances in technology. Sure, there's a factor there. Technology is going to come along and, and help us. And everywhere I go, I see that we talk about the futures with our children, the next generation. So I wanted to point out, this is exciting to me, that in education, the next generation science standards for K through 12 includes climate change. They're taking real world problems to study, not problems that already have been documented with the right answer. We would like to be able to get children to think critically. And we've been trying to, educators have been asking this for a long time, how do we get students to think? Okay? And scientists do it every day. So we've seen in the education that there's been a process to, to look at critical thinking or science-based learning or whatever you want to call it, the scientific method. But we're incorporating that into education. I'm glad to see that. And we're also talking about STEM. This is the integration. It's just not science in this classroom and math in this classroom and mathematics over here and something else. They should be taught integrated. These subjects are much more interesting to memorize a, or learn a mathematical equation when I've got a purpose to use it. And so for me, I think the, the most important thing to look at is our future. Our future will be with our students. And I'm really excited to say that we're moving in the right direction. Because giving our children the opportunity to know more about the real world problems and work on them when they're not biased at young minds, particularly in K through 12, I think that we'll have more known knowns. Thank you. This is the part we haven't rehearsed. <laughs> So at this point, I believe we have some time for questions and answers. I'll do my best with the answers. But I have to have some questions. Uh, yes, I see that you um, really made no mention of um, emissions reductions as a strategy to deal with global warming. I saw, <clears throat> excuse me, a buried graphic about a carbon tax, sure. um, which might be a policy solution. Um, but could you address po the, the possibility of emissions reductions? Absolutely. Um, we'd love to re reduce the amount of CO2 that's, that we currently use. I mean, this is the whole campaign we hear about reducing our carbon footprints. But to do that, we would have to simply stop burning fossil fuel or find a way to trap the carbon emissions before they're released, whether they're coming out of the automobile stack I mean, a smokestack or a refinery stack or from, from a tailpipe of a car. Hybrid cards will help and all that. But the problem is, you know, who's responsible for, for the increased use of CO2? We'd love to blame industry, but, you know, we all like electricity. So um, as someone wise told me, when you're pointing your finger at somebody shaking your finger, remember three are pointing back. So part of that is what responsibility do we want to take? And even with the Kyoto Protocol, in all fairness, the United States didn't sign it because we put in a lot of the technology to make our fuel clean. We're probably the cleanest fuel anywhere in the world. But we're at that last sort of what I call the 90-10 rule. You can get the 90% reduction pretty quickly, make it cleaner. But that last 10% percent, percent 
costs a lot. So it would impact our economy as well. So clearly, we have to reduce CO2 emissions. I'm a scientist, I can tell you that. I'm not a policymaker. I don't know how to tell you to do that. Fair enough? To what extent does animal agriculture impact climate change? And are you familiar with a documentary called Cowspiracy? Yes, very good. Boy, I'll tell you, my first exposure to this was on a talk show with Milt Rosenberg. And um, this was a long time ago, but um, he always had a way of asking a question and turning to one of the guests in the studio and say, what do you think about that? So my first question that I got was, well, we understand um, that you know, cattle contribute. So uh, what can you tell us about bovine flatulence, Doug? <laughs> <laughs> so we have looked at this, and science has looked at this. Clearly, animals do produce uh, greenhouse gases. But when you take greenhouse gases as a worldwide emission and look at their contribution as an entire whole, they're not close to the emissions of CO2 that are coming from the burning of fossil fuels. Hi, Doug. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Uh, this is a matter of disclosure. <clears throat> I write regularly in the major press, the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, the Financial Times, and others on climate policy and uh, environmental policy. I'm a retired aerospace uh, executive. Um, I think there's one major fact I don't think you brought up which the public needs to understand as far as data and fact. And that is um, understanding who the number one um, consumer of fossil fuels is in the world, the single largest consumer, and the single largest emitter of carbon is the U.S. military. And the U.S. military is not a signatory to any climate agreements. That's one. And two, as far as um, linking um, climate change, so-called, with extreme weather. Um, there's over 100 major um, geoengineering experiments conducted around the world by eight major countries, U.S. is one, uh, involving atmospheric chemical engineering <clears throat> and directed energy technology uh, manipulation. Uh, and until those are filtered from the observable data that you have, um, your data is contaminated. So those are my comments. My question is, can you explain to us how <clears throat> how carbon moves the jet stream. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of information here. Let me move backwards and say, how does carbon move the jet stream? Well, again, part of the, 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 the talk tonight was what are we, the science-based evidence is that the CO2 emissions are warming the atmosphere. It doesn't take much to figure out this. A little bit of greenhouse gases can cause a huge change in the balance of how much heat is trapped at night. And so how is that heat dissipated? I think the best example I can give you is that we saw that the Eastern Pacific uh, uh, Ocean was, was, uh, uh, was extremely warm this year, record high. And, and this allowed, in a, a particular case, um, Typhoon Nuri, which was the strongest typhoon, the strongest typhoon hit the Philippines last year. This one was even stronger than that. And missed fortunately Japan, but it was the one that pushed up that we saw in the video up to, to basically changing the buckling the jet stream, which allowed Arctic air to filter in to, to North America. And because it was always warm and we couldn't get rid of that heat, that was sort of a, a seasonal change in the normal pattern that we had. I'm here to suggest that the way that climate change will be manifested in extreme weather events is, is the, the invisible force of a reaction to another reaction to something that we see. And science is betting that Typhoon Nuri was actually the cause of the weather events that we have. You know, as a scientist, we kind of know that, we believe that, but we have to go through and peer review and bet that. And so it will show up in the scientific journals. And so the suggestion I was making tonight is I was trying to give you examples of how scientists see how increase of the single most that we understand um, database that we have, that we believe, that's been vetted to use towards understanding the scientific processes suggests that there, sure, there's uncertainties with a lot of different things, but we're confident enough in the database to say that, sure, there's other factors locally that contribute to an imbalance. But on a global scale, the increase of fossil fuel emissions is by far the single, single most factor that we have to deal with.
And as far as military aircraft being um, beyond that, I understand. Um, we take data. We try to understand the competence we have in the data that we take. We vet it, and, and we put it in journals. And, that, and we still, as skeptics, keep vetting that process. You know, we, we really never have the right answer forever. It's always challenged. So I would say that the story that I gave tonight is, is the high-level story. You can always find some examples that might uh, suggest some other studies. But I would still say that, respectfully, that science-based evidence of what we believe the story I've given you tonight is, is, is a, is a high-level is, is what science believes is happening with climate and weather. Yes, my young friend. How many people would have to reduce their carbon uses to help climate change? Oh, boy, that's a great question. How many people? Well, I guess I would put it to you the other way. How many people do you think contribute to climate change? Um, I don't really know what that means. OK, so well, you asked me, how many people would we you know, have to, what would we have to do? Let's say there's lots of people on the Earth, a couple of billion people. Yeah. And, and if we all use electricity or if we all drive cars, we're all contributing to the carbon footprint, the greenhouse gases that are warming our Earth. So I interpret your question to be pretty much so what do we got to do to reduce that impact, right? How do, what can we do to make it less? Mm, at least more than half the people that are in the world that like, are using carbon dioxide. Well, I probably think that almost all the people in the world are using it at some point. And so we all have to be responsible. So I'm not telling you that we should just turn off all the electricity in the world and, and, and we don't, can't even burn wood because that's burning carbon. So what we have to do is not be wasteful. So when your mom says, don't forget to turn out the lights, that would be a good place to start. If we all do what we can do and help reduce how much electricity and things that take carbon to manufacture them, then we're all helping. We're all helping. So if maybe you ride your bike a little more and ask for a ride for mom and dad a little less, that's a good way to do it. If you plan your trips so that more than one friend can be in one car instead of five friends meeting with five cars, that's a great way to do it, too. You see what I mean? Yeah. And you can help with that. Just turn out the lights. Does that help? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'll stand up for the next one. <laughs> I'll stand this up, too. Um, can you address um, the issue of uh, why the Arctic is warming, the poles, but let's stay in the Arctic, it's warming faster than uh, every place else on average, and the work of Jennifer Francis at Rutgers University, and this issue of uh, the temperature differential equatorial polar affecting formation of the jet stream and its weakening? Wow. Thank you. Do we have another 45 minutes? Um, let me go simple, that, that in science, we learned something even in our elementary kids about the Hadley cell. So basically, the Earth is warmer at the equators, and it's cold at the polar regions. Makes sense. So the air rises from the equator and subsides at the poles. So even though there's a larger area of warmer air around the globe, it's kind of concentrated at the points. And it's, so it's what we call the Hadley flow. It's just warm air rises, it cools off, it subsides over the poles. And so we're constantly exchanging warm air over the tropics, being cooled off by the polar regions. That's kind of how we maintain that balmy 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So um, now the Earth rotates. And it's not a simple just all land. It's, it's land and it's ocean. And so as the Earth rotates, it starts to shift some of those northward bound and southward bound jet streams. And so now we start to get a sort of a, a, a contribution of west to east type of rotation in the northern hemisphere and just the opposite of the southern hemisphere. And the wind patterns are now going to be driven more locally about the ocean land interface. And so these set up the jet streams. And yes, there's been some ideas that if, if the um, temperature differential between land and water become less, those are the things that drive the jet stream. Maybe the jet streams will be less. That's the complicating factor about climate change, because it's what happens. It's what we call climate forcing. If 
certain a domino effect of this happens and this happens and this happens, if all those things happen and increase global warming, that's a positive reinforcement of global warming. If they mitigate it, it's a negative feedback. And so we're looking at what are all these feedbacks that have been postulated in terms of a question of the weakening of the jet streams, what, what effect that will have. It's a great question, and that's some of the things that our models are looking at now. Yeah, I think one of the most important things you said is we need a mixed bag. That is, we need to use multiple things. But one you really haven't mentioned so far, and you said, well, we really do like to produce carbon dioxide. We like to consume fossil fuels. But to what extent and how rapidly can we, uh, for example, divest from fossil fuels and invest that money in wind and solar and in a smart grid, say with very high voltage DC, uh, allowing for rapid and efficient transmission from one area to another, and battery storage, uh, and say water pumping storage or hot uh, sodium uh, to store that energy. It seems to me that ought to be a very high priority. Well, it certainly is a high priority at a place like Argonne National Lab because we're divesting our portfolio to look at different energy sources. But it comes back to, it's, it's interesting, the Department of Energy is for a safe and secure national energy policy. So the secure part, well, that's one part of it. But the safe part is, what kind of emissions will we have in future alternative sources that's going to affect us in ways we didn't know that carbon dioxide would? And I would pose to you that the only way to do that is we have to somehow construct a model that we can test. Let's, get, let's understand Mother Nature. If we understand the physics of all these complicated interactions between jet streams and, and oceans and so forth, can we now, if we understand that, ask it a question? What happens if I add this new trace gas? What happens if I double this? What happens if the jet stream weakens? We can start to actually look at some of those scenarios before we start to embark on some of those alternative fuel strategies just to ensure that we're not making another problem. I don't think either wind energy or solar, well, solar perhaps, uh, have that problem. Well, you know, um, I, I, I see Seth back there, and he probably doesn't want to be put on the spot. But uh, Seth and I did write a book, and I was the climate side, and Seth was the engineering side. And, and Seth is very much into um, um, solar energy and research. And um, I, I would, I'd love to give the mic to Seth right now, but he represents the side of the house that's doing that kind of research. I don't. So it's really hard for me to really answer your question because, frankly, I don't know the answer. That's a problem. So Seth, raise your hand. See, there's Seth. He would be much better, if you want to ask that question, Seth would be much better to do that than I would. Seth Darling. Yes. <clears throat> yes, I just want to go back to an earlier assessment you made about uh, methane emissions. Yes. Was that uh, uh, just a mass-based assessment, or did that also factor in volatility of methane? Because I've heard that it's more volatile, considerably more volatile than uh, carbon. Yes, you're right. So in, in, in what I was showing is that there are some greenhouse gases that have more of an impact of trapping heat than others. So methane might be 100 or 1,000 times more effective at greenhouse gas trapping the heat than carbon dioxide. And I agree. Um, but the issues that we're showing that, and, and you could argue that a small change in methane could, could have, if we were to normalize all the impacts of, of the different uh, greenhouse gases, what would that look like? I would still say that for, in an audience like this, probably the best way to show you is, is that it's the carbon dioxide that's giving us the biggest perturbation to our climate than any of the other greenhouse gases by far. So, you know, one thing I think is a bit worry, one thing I think is a bit worrisome is the idea that individuals can, you know, ride their bikes more or something. I mean, that's all fine, but if industries are continuing to, you know, ship uh, train loads of uh, coal to China and et cetera, trying to get every last drop of fossil fuels out of the ground, et cetera, um, those are not going to have much of an impact. So I think. One of the things that individuals can do, really, that would make an impact is to pressure their government to uh, reduce, uh, I mean, to I find, only passively better, suggest, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. I think that, you know, um, 
The biggest thing is, th is that you should, as a voice of the public, boy, you write one letter to a congressman and they, they turn that into about 1,000 votes. So I think that if we want effective energy policies, I think it's smart on every one of us to understand what our, our local politicians or how are they going to vote when they go to Congress. And the more you know about the problem, the more they will have to vote more on what I would call science-based evidence rather than, how shall I put it delic delicately, political games. Again, that's not my, my, my background, and, and, and I want to keep on the science side that I have this other little problem that I'm trying to put out there. There are others that take the information that we have and hopefully translate into policy and an economic thing that's fair and will help solve the problem that we have. It's huge. If it was easy, we would have solved it a long time ago. But I agree with you. Um, you spoke about the, um, the ocean levels rising. Um, but here locally, you said something about um, Lake Michigan right. might drop by six two feet. feet. Yeah, two feet. I think, yeah. or two. You In said, I thought years, you yeah. said six. Um, I, I didn't Sorry. understand why. That yeah, I mentioned that was kind of a surprise to me because that wasn't what you'd expect. I mean, the Great Lakes are kind of connected to the oceans. So it wasn't clear to me, and I honestly should go back to the study and see what they meant by reducing the lakes by two feet. You know, part of the deal is you can control the amount of flowing uh, water that flows by locks and dams, and they might have been just looking at discharge that was feeding the Great Lakes from the local drainage basins into the lakes, that the effect of overall precipitation would be such that that, that without considering ocean level rise, that, that the net deficit in 100 years would be water loss in the Midwest rather than gain. Good question. Uh, this is a suggestion for everyone here. Um, I went to a uh, Wild Things conference at the University of Illinois about six weeks ago. There were 1,600 people there. There was nothing on climate change. A good deal about the reintroduction of uh, bison in this state and, and restoring prairie. So my suggestion is, you know, lots of people, average people, went to high school and they did biology in 10th grade and then chemistry and then physics in 12th grade. All those processes in the real world are not in different years as we studied them. So my suggestion is, instead of just climate disruption, we start calling it climate ecology disruption because there are so many people around the world that are concerned with the butterflies in their backyard but just don't get it. It's a great suggestion. <laughs> it's a great suggestion. As you mentioned, there are some people out there that are just ideologically opposed to the whole idea or that are out for political or some other kind of gain and all that. But what I find when I am in discussion about climate change with a lot of people is there's a lot of people out there who have no ideological or gain-based opposition to it. They're just confused from all the information out there. You're at a party or something. You're talking to people. You run across this. You have a few minutes to try to... Uh, you know, just to get them to think a little more deeply, ponder more deeply on this. They're, they're not going to go to a presentation like this. What do you say? Okay. Well, I'm reaching for my wallet because I wasn't going to do this, but um, <laughs> Seth Darling and I had the same passion that you have. How do we get the message out? We turn to the media to get, we don't have time to read scientific journals and understand what they mean. So where do we get this integrated information? We'd like to be able to think we're getting the fair and balanced reporting on the news through television, sound bites, m magazines, newspaper. Well, I'm furious that we don't. They'll give you the, you know, 50% of the airtime is on the consensus science viewpoint, and the other 50% is this really crazy idea that sounds really good for a bite line for the news to get you watch their station. The problem is they don't tell you which is which. Okay, and that's very difficult. So I, I wasn't going to do this, but I will. There's this really neat book. <laughs> <laughs> and Seth and I got together, and we, 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 we've been through this. Seth has his own reasons, too. We, we get embarrassed if we can't answer a question. And we actually wrote a trade book. This is how do you take the 15 most popular climate denier arguments and debunk them with science-based evidence? And guess what? 
We did it in the same English that I provided you tonight in this presentation. So um, I can assure you, I, going down the journey of writing a book, um, Seth and I are not going to get rich anytime soon. And we didn't do it to get rich. But we did it because we were just as frustrated as you. We go one seminar, one lecture at a time. How do we reach more people? We're going to reach more people if I tell you and you tell somebody else and somebody else. So if you want to be armed with those kind of neat, it's Thanksgiving, we're talking over the turkey, and Uncle Charlie brings up something, there's a resource for you out there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Doug. Doug will be around for a little bit if you have questions about his book or anything else. <laughs> so uh, we'll adjourn for now. Thanks again, Doug. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>